No matter how hard I try, I just can't keep up with this story. As soon as I finished this video, Telemundo is now saying that according to neighbor interviews, they have confirmed one that the woman depicted in the clip later in this video is the girl's mother. Two, that the mother is in a romantic relationship with the now confessed abuser of her daughter. And three, that mom is in fact carrying that man's child herself currently. She is also pregnant, but has not received an abortion. I speculate about this possible relationship later in the video. If these interviews are to be believed, that speculation is now confirmed. Story linked in the description for your own evaluation, and now on to the original video. All right, first things first, if you didn't see what happened with my usual Wednesday video, I had to retract it. And that's something I've never had to do in my history of making videos, because I've never had developments in a story prove me so wrong so quickly right after posting it. I'll link my Twitter thread explaining exactly what happened in the description, but the general summary is this. There was an original claim that a pregnant 10-year-old Ohio girl had to leave the state and go to Indiana to get an abortion because of cruel, oppressive Ohio laws. This claim was pushed for political reasons by the president and amplified uncritically by national media, but it was all based on one very generally worded, nonspecific story in the Indy Star. That story itself sourced only to the claims of one abortionist doctor who said that she provided the service. And the lack of support for the story in news reports, paired with no law enforcement agency in Ohio even being aware of an investigation into this incident as of Monday night, convinced me that this story was another fake. I called it another outright Jussie Smollett, Christine Blasey Ford style hoax, an unverified sensationalist story that emerges suddenly to assist a progressive political priority. My thumbnail for the video said, this did not happen. I posted that breakdown on Wednesday morning. It's still up on Listed, and I'll link that too in case you still want to see it or in case you want to scrutinize it or criticize it. I am not trying to hide it. I said this story did not happen, and then it took the sharpest U-turn I've ever seen a story take. Mid-morning Wednesday, about three hours after I posted that video, the Columbus Dispatch reported there is suddenly now an arrest in the case and a confession. A 27-year-old Guatemalan illegal immigrant who's been in the country for seven years named Herson Fuentes. And Fuentes now admits that he violated this girl at least twice. Now, of course, given that abrupt turnaround and some of this new information, there are now plenty more questions to ask about this story, and we'll get to that, but before we do, to be abundantly clear, none of my additional discussion on this story is intended in any way to absolve myself of getting the story wrong last time. I did get it wrong, and I take full responsibility for publishing wrong information. I guess I've seen way too many hoax hate crimes, and I jumped to an unsupported conclusion based on thinking that I've seen this movie at least 50 times before, when in fact, this is apparently something different. So I apologize for that error, and I commit to doing better work in the future. It is in that spirit that I stick with this story, not to explain away my own mistakes, but to keep digging for the truth. And it's why I'm deliberate with the title of this video. It is not, I got it wrong, but look at this distraction over here. No, it's I got it wrong and this story still keeps getting weirder. So in pursuit of fixing my botched attempt at the truth, Let's take another crack at the new developments in the story, because there's still a lot that doesn't make much sense. Starting with the timeline of events, which remains anything but clear. How exactly did a story go from no publicly known substantiating evidence, not just for the story itself, but for any investigation into it even, to suddenly an arrest made and a confession given all within about 12 hours and only after the story became politically hot. Well, as part of this new report, we have learned that Franklin County Children's Services in Columbus had a report of this incident on June 22nd. At Tuesday's court hearing, a police detective testified that's how police became aware of the case, though when that referral from the Children's Services Department to the police department was made is still unclear. But if authorities had knowledge of this case dating back to June 22nd, then how was the Ohio Attorney General saying on Monday night he hasn't heard a whisper of any such story or investigation, despite asking sheriffs and prosecutors across the state, including 
in Columbus. Maybe he's just bad at his job, you might think. That's one possible answer. The Daily Beast says he's just lazy. He could have walked six blocks from his office over to the Columbus Police Department and found the answer, but he didn't. The trouble with that explanation, though, is that he did contact Columbus and Franklin County authorities, or at least he says he did. But even if you don't believe him, journalists tried it too. Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post, in fact-checking the story, contacted child services in Columbus, who again, apparently had this report on June 22nd. Kessler's story was published on July 9th. Child services said they had no such report. And Megan Fox at PJ Media, who started the critical look at this story, also contacted Columbus PD looking for any information on such a case, and they never responded to her. So I put in a FOIA last week to the Columbus police asking for this very case. Do you have an investigation that involves a 10 year old being raped? Uh, they did not respond to me, but Glenn Kessler got him on the phone and they told him no. OK, but maybe the investigation was still in its early stages. Maybe those responding at Children's Services and the Columbus PD just weren't aware of the investigation yet. Well, one. We aren't talking the day after a report or something like that. This report was created on June 22nd, and these information requests were two weeks later. And two, at the time that these agencies were saying that no investigation exists, this case was actually well beyond just initial investigation. The suspect was already identified. According to court documents, the girl identified Fuentes as her attacker to police on July 6th. So if the report existed for weeks and the suspect was identified by the victim and the police were pursuing a search warrant to swab the guy's DNA, as court documents also say, why were police simultaneously saying that no investigation exists? The immediate answer to speculate, and again, after last video, I will emphasize speculate, these are not established facts, just a possible explanation is that what looks like a cover-up might have been done to protect illegal immigrants from discovery. Columbus considers itself a sanctuary city in spirit, if not in formal title, and has a recent history of shielding illegal immigrants from federal immigration authorities. And if authorities were hiding information for that reason, it wouldn't necessarily have to be to protect the suspect either. If the attacker is an illegal immigrant, there's a high likelihood that others involved in the story are also illegal immigrants. Maybe the girl he attacked is. Maybe her family is. I wrongly assumed this story was faked for political abortion reasons, but maybe the lack of information in this case was in the interest of protecting illegal immigrants. That would start to make the story make sense. And it does, at least a little, until it makes the story even stranger. It would appear this family affair theory has some legitimacy, at least according to a bizarre interview by Telemundo. They sent a reporter to the home of the girl and spoke with her mom, and mom says, don't worry, the little girl is fine, and actually, everybody is being very unfair to the attacker, Fuentes. They're lying about him, and she isn't seeking charges against him. La niña vivía aquí también. <laughs> Sí, pero ella está bien. Todo lo que están diciendo en contra de él es mentira. Ya. Y la niña, eh, ¿usted es familiar de la niña? Es mi hija. La señora quien se negó a dar su nombre y quien ocultó su rostro asegura que ella no ha impuesto cargos en contra de Gerson Fuentes de 27 años. Now, given the insane twists in this story, I will first emphasize we do not have authentication that is actually the girl's mom. It's just a woman claiming to be. And as recognized in the replies, it is common for adults to falsely claim parenthood when crossing the border for all sorts of purposes. So we shouldn't take it as confirmed that this woman is who she says she is. It's also unclear what she means when she says they're lying about him. Is she saying the whole story is contrived? I already got myself in trouble with that theory once, so without any further evidence, I won't dabble in that again. But for the sake of analysis, let's say this is exactly what it appears to be. This is the girl's mom, and she has some apparent interest in defending her daughter's attacker. The obvious question is why? And even if she isn't the victim's mom, another source gives the same impression. According to court documents, this case was brought to children's services by the girl's mom, and notably, only to children's services, and not to police. Police learned of this case from children's services, not from the mother, 
implying mom was interested in medical services, but not law enforcement. So why not law enforcement? Well, there are several reasons why mom might be interested in protecting this guy. Again, speculation, not fact, but of course, the obvious that exposure of his immigration status might risk exposure of theirs. But as some additional evidence implies, it might be even closer than that. Maybe he's a source of income for the family, or maybe he's mom's romantic partner. At Tuesday's court hearing, the suspect's public defender argued for lower bond and his release on the grounds that he has a place he can live that is not the same as the 10-year-old's, implying that he was living in the same place as the 10-year-old. If so, one, why did it take so long to track this guy down? And two, was he living in the same household with the girl that he violated in the week between his identification to police on July 6th and his arrest on July 12th? It is a mess of missing detail, but it would appear this timeline does not add up with prioritizing the safety of this girl for three weeks after that initial report. Her attacker, despite apparently being very close with her family and quite possibly living with them in that time frame, was walking free with no apparent police urgency in apprehending him. And even that timeline says nothing about all the time prior as well. This girl was allegedly impregnated about May 12th meaning two months passed between the assault and the arrest, despite everyone knowing who this guy is in the meantime. Why? That is remaining question number one. And how did all this time pass despite multiple doctors knowing about the attack too? That is remaining question number two. And again, I enter this topic with an apology for getting it wrong prior. I thought that abortionist Dr. Caitlin Bernard made the whole thing up. She did not. Indeed, she filed the proper paperwork on the June 30th abortion with the Indiana Health Department, as new documentation now shows. But for the question that documentation answers, it also raises a new one. Why did she list the father's age as 17? He's 27, and the girl knew who he was the whole time. Now, that could be just an innocent bad guess, or... That could be a deliberate effort to shield the attacker, much like mom did. And even if innocent, that report doesn't mean that all necessary reporting was handled properly either. I don't say that to accuse, we just don't know yet. I say that to ask questions in search of demonstration. Recall the abortionist doctor, Caitlin Bernard, said she was referred this case by a still unnamed child abuse doctor in Ohio. But in both states, Ohio and Indiana, any medical professional who becomes aware of child abuse must report that child abuse to the authorities. Failure to report is a crime. So far, we have no demonstration that Bernard notified child services or law enforcement. So far, we have no demonstration that the referring Ohio doctor notified child services or law enforcement. We only have demonstration that this case became known to authorities by mom telling children's services in Franklin County. It does not mean that the required reporting from these doctors didn't happen it does mean that there are legal implications if it didn't. And on the point of that referral, that's the last piece I'll reference that still needs clarification too. Recall, Biden said this girl was forced to leave Ohio because of their new abortion law. 10 years old, and she was forced to have to travel out of the state to Indiana to seek to terminate the presidency and maybe save her life. Even though the Ohio AG says that is not a proper reading of the state's new law, which would offer an abortion exception to cover this situation, and indeed, nobody would be prosecuted for providing an abortion in this case. Ohio's heartbeat law has a medical emergency exception broader than just the life uh, of the mother. She did not have to leave Ohio to find treatment. So was this actually force or was this just voluntary referral out of state? We have no demonstration that anybody forced anything in this case. We only have demonstration, apparently, that one doctor referred a child to another doctor out of state. The same sort of referral that happens all the time for a variety of services and for a variety of reasons. If the claim is force, well, then the question is who forced? And how? And so far, we don't have any answer to that one. Fundamentally, the pieces of this story 
are still adding up to what made it suspicious in the first place, that secondary interests are being prioritized over the interests of this girl. I take full responsibility for what I said about this story that was false. But that doesn't mean that this story is in proper focus or reliably presented either. We were told that this story demonstrates that the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision that overturned Roe was incorrectly decided as a matter of constitutional law. How? Whether Ohio's law is wise or not, it is plainly Ohio's right to make the law that governs this issue within the state. And there is no evidence that Ohio's law was in fact as cruel as originally claimed. We were told that an abortion is somehow a solution in this case. Again, how? How does stacking additional tragedy on top of the issues of illegal immigration and the violation of a child a fix? Hey, don't worry about the border or about child predators. As long as we can abort, it's fine. The proper conclusion in this story is none of these things. The proper conclusion is, without the scrutiny, this story is never actually about this girl at all, or preventing future attacks like this one at all. It is only about making her useful for a political agenda. A political agenda that makes cases like hers more likely, not less. The only reason we even know about this story is because the president made this little girl into a political weapon, not because he showed any sincere effort at actually finding her attacker or is showing any sincere effort at stopping future attackers like him. The purpose of this story in the public eye was never justice for the victim. The purpose was propagandizing you into believing that this one incredibly rare event means that it's unjust for states to regulate the 99 plus percent of abortions that look nothing like it, and that it's unjust for you to vote to decide. Case in point, now that the progressive political utility of this story has taken major damage with the immigration revelation, see how long this story stays in focus. Will the same people hyping it with a lack of detail continue to hype it now that we have more specifics? Or will the story disappear just as fast as it U-turned on Wednesday? Suddenly, now that we know who the attacker is and it's inconvenient for another political priority, will this story just isn't as important as, say, January 6th or gun control or the next abortion story that's an extreme outlier but somehow demonstrates that the vast majority are supposedly justifiable anyway. I acknowledge my failure in the pursuit of the truth in this story, and I apologize for that. But I do not grant that pursuit of the truth was the effort of those who pushed it in the first place. Blind squirrels do get nuts, and I suppose they may have in this case. But even that is far too kind of a metaphor. These people lack the perception. They lack the attention span. They lack the honesty in their work. Impaired rodents are far too diligent and dignified to compare. After all, if I have to pick between the CNN ticker and a blind squirrel, no contest. Give me the blind squirrel every single time. Thanks as always for listening and for supporting this channel. Always appreciate that thoughtful discussion down below and especially over on Gab that is at M L Christensen. You're always welcome to coming out and chatting my live streams. Those are linked down in the description. Looking forward to it. Come on.